of a purely algorithmic stablecoin that doesn't uh, rely on a centralized entity to keep some reserves. Based on the way you described it, I wouldn't invest in coin like that. <laughs> CZ, the CEO of Binance, has been among the harshest critics of Terra following the stablecoin's spectacular collapse. Binance is now supporting the revival of the Terra blockchain and its Luna token. We still have to protect the users. We have to support the revival plan, hoping that it makes it work. In this video, CZ explains why Binance is supporting the relaunch of Terra. He also shares his views on the future of algorithmic and fiat-backed stablecoins. As always, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't done it already. I'm Giovanni, your host, and this is a Cointelegraph interview. The Terra protocol collapsed a couple of weeks ago. You uh, were pretty critical in the way the Terra uh, team handled the crisis and also you, you were pretty critical of the Terra system. You pointed out uh, the flaws that uh, made this collapse possible. So can you explain me why Binance decided that despite all that was interested in participating in the revival of the uh, Luna ecosystem? So I think, um, re yeah, so I think the, the project team definitely made some not so good decisions and the response was kind of slow. Um, but regardless, we still have to protect the users. Uh, we still have a decent number of users who hold the uh, uh, Luna coin and uh, we still need to uh, ensure continuity of people's access to liquidity. So when the project team do issue a new coin, uh, we, um, we actually have to support it uh, just, by, just given the number of users involved. There is a lot of skepticism about this attempt to revitalize the ecosystem. Do you think that Luna has the chance to, um, to gain the trust of investors after what happened? Um, so on that one, I, we, I try not to predict what the community will do. Um, I think there's a large number of people, some, some, many are skeptical. Uh, I'm one of those guys. Um, but then there's also many that, that are wishing, hoping for the uh, project to recover. And I'm also, I'm also hoping that too. So uh, uh, that I can't really predict, but we have to go by users. So we do the best thing to protect, our, to, to give our users liquidity. And cutting off access doesn't, doesn't help. So we, 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 have to, we have to support whatever, whatever the project team does. Um, to, uh, in their we have to support the revival plan, hoping that it may work. Can I ask you why are you skeptical? the same reasons for everybody like you know we, um i think uh, I, I voiced my concerns already like the, the, some there were some design flaws at the beginning of the project um the way they handled the crisis uh, the responses were a little bit slow uh, so i hope they learn from those lessons but um, of course everybody i'm always skeptical to some extent as well so Besides the airdrop, uh, Binance is also involved in migrating uh, a lot of projects that were on the Terra blockchain into the Binance blockchain. So that's also another way Binance is involved in uh, re reviving this ecosystem. So what is the rationale behind that? Um, why do you think it was important for Binance to get involved with that? Um, to be very frank, with or without Luna's incident, we always welcome, uh, we always try to help people to build a, a Binance uh, BNB chain. So um, that's always there. Um, so any developer that wants to build on BNB chain, if they need assistance, if they're doing a good project, they need assistance, please talk to our team. And then in this case, in the, in the case of T uh, Luna, Terra, um, there are quite a number of projects that are looking for new places. And it's just a very natural thing to do, right? So we want to help them to, to, to uh, if they, uh, we will welcome to build on BNB chain. Um, it's very simple, yeah. This accident uh, actually uh, brought about a lot of uh, criticism and skepticism towards the stablecoin technology in general, in particular, algorithmic stablecoins. So what do you think is the future for algorithmic stablecoins after this collapse? Do you think that this technology has still a chance to uh, survive? I think stable coins should work uh, in theory. Uh, it, it has risks. Um, nothing, nothing has zero risk. Uh, even, the, even the currency, that, even euros that you, we you use today have risks. Um, euros is only 50 years old or, or less. So um, everything we use have risks. Um, I think with this instant, it just teaches us to view the risks more clearly. I think many people didn't understand what algo stable coins are. They just went for the higher yield. Uh, not understanding that the high yield comes with high risks. So I think this, this, this teaches us that, uh, re this reminds us again of that. 
Um, but I do think is um, I do think that if properly managed, uh, if well managed, um, I think algorithms, stable coins, uh, in theory, should work. Yeah. And can you get a bit deeper into this? Like I know that you were explaining uh, some characteristics that this algorithmic stablecoin should have in order to prevent situations like the one that we saw with Terra ha from happening. Yeah, I mean, ideally, you always want to be over collateralized. So it's just a matter of how making sure that you're properly over collateralized um, using the algorithm. Um, I think there were some design flaws. The, the one key design flaw, which I mentioned in the blog post, is uh, uh, the fact that they think minting more Lunas will create more value. And then that can be used to save the, uh, um, uh, to restore the pack. That doesn't work. Uh, minting new coins does not work. But if you, let's say if you have a basket of 50% you know, uh, BTC, 50% uh, Ethereum, 25% uh, uh, Ethereum, 25% um, BNB plus some other coins, um, and if you manage the ratios correctly, in theory, it actually should work. So, uh, um, but it's, nothing's risk-free. If all of those other uh, assets, you use as collateral assets drop significantly uh, more than the collateral percentage, then you, you can still have a deep pack situation. So nothing's 100% risk-free. Right, but now you're mentioning collateral. So we're, you're not talking about purely algorithmic stable coins. You are talking more about crypto collateralized stable coins. What about just purely, purely algorithmic stable coins? It means like stable coins that uh, work just because of this uh, arbitrage opportunity and they don't have anything backing them up on the background. Do you think that uh, is, can, can still work? Uh, based on the way you described it, I wouldn't invest in a coin like that. <laughs> if, you, if you write down your thoughts, just in those paragraphs, no one will invest in your coin. When you have a slightly more details, you you actually, we can actually see the smart contract, see the white paper, etc. There's a bit more substance to it. I saw that you wrote a, a blog post where you described the, how, the, how um, fiat-backed stablecoin should ideally um, inspire trust in investors. Can you maybe sum up what are these characteristics that, uh, according to you, are the most important for a fiat-backed stablecoin for being trusted? Uh, a fiat-backed one is much simpler to understand. You just got to have that money in the bank um, and then ideally should be audited. In, in the case of BUSD, um, there's 90%, uh, 96% uh, in the bank, according to their report. Um, and um, it's very simple. Even that, you, you cannot say it's risk-free, right? So, so I think BUSD has the highest uh, cash reserve ratio already in, uh, of all the stable coins in the industry. Um, and, uh, but even that, you know, the, even banks can go bankrupt. We've seen that happen many, many times in the past. So nothing's risk-free, but I think BUSD is already, in terms of cash reserves, is the highest ratio. And the rest of the 4%, I, I believe is in treasury bonds and stuff like that, based on their report. So, uh, um, yeah, so, but everybody needs to understand the risks involved in, in any coin, any, any financial instrument, anything, to be honest. When we saw the Terra fiasco, we saw Tether, the USDT, depegging shortly from the value of the dollar. We saw a flight to safety towards uh, Binance stablecoin. So what did create this uh, different uh, uh, reaction from investors that moved away from, from Tether and put their assets into a Binance stablecoin? Sure, um, I, I can guess. Again, there's many people involved, so everybody may have a different reason. Um, but uh, BUSD is one of the most transparent. They issue a report on how, how much cash reserves are, uh, are there. It's fully audited. It's, uh, it's issued by a NYDFS, a New York Department of Financial Services regulated entity. So um, that level of transparency, that level of uh, uh, reserves, I think pr uh, probably is, a, is the, probably uh, one of the biggest factors. Um, USDT, uh, they did not, we don't really know how much is where. Uh, we don't know where the reserves are. So that lack of transparency probably increases risk or, or the perceived, uh, perceived uh, risk. Um, uh, USDC has less cash reserves as well. So I think just being transparent, just high, high cash reserves, um, transparency for BUSD, many people, uh, many people went for that safety. And so you was in high demand as other people, probably other users converting from other stable coins into BUSD. Why do you think that Tether still remains the most used stable coin all over the world? Um, so again, I can, I can only guess, uh, Tether is one of the first ones. Um, it's, it's been around since 2014 or, or even earlier. Um, and um, it's adopted by many exchanges around the world. Uh, BUSD is quite new. 
USD is only like three, three years old. I think it was starting in 2019. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think uh, it, has a, it, has, it has network effects. Uh, most of the exchanges, um, when the biggest trading pair, the biggest liquid, highest liquidity trading pair is usually um, the a native coin uh, versus USDT. And then more and more, that has a network effect. More users that come in, they want to, use, they want to trade on that pair and they use more of that. So uh, there is first mover advantages and there's, there's network effects and there's also inheritance effects that, that, that's still at play. We came out from a very difficult situation in the crypto ecosystem. Uh, the market is also not in the best shape. Um, I saw that you drew some fundamental lessons from the latest uh, market turmoil. Maybe do you want to share some of those uh, lessons with us? Actually, one of the things that's happening in the industry, uh, given this incident, is uh, we should very carefully review all the incentive to use crypto. So play to earn, um, read to earn, whatever, whatever, like high APY staking. Uh, we should really look at them in a fundamental way to make sure there's high, more revenue, uh, more income generated than the than the just the like incentives pay, uh, pay out. So um, uh, I think those areas are very very interesting. That's a good mechanism to attract new users, but you still have to have a sustainable model in the long run. So mm -hmm. I think uh, the 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 game file, play to earn, social file, all of those things, um, they're very interesting. But we need to um, uh, we 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 need to learn from this instant and make stronger business models and. Uh, and be more, uh, be more, uh, be more skeptical about the sort of incentives. You, you mean because if those incentives are above the actual income that, that the project bring in, then it turns into a Ponzi scheme, right? Yeah, basically. Well, you, you, so yeah, I mean, basically, you can if if you're paying out to get users always more than your income. If you do that forever, eventually you're going to run out of money. Right, so that's um, uh, it doesn't matter what else you do. Uh, so at some point, you have to have your income overtake your your, your expenses. Uh, otherwise, you don't have a sustainable ecosystem. Um, uh, so yeah, it's as simple as that. So um, uh, incentives should only be used as a bootstrap mechanism to attract users in to to get to a growth uh, trajectory, and then but you have to have income. So do you think that that's probably the biggest issue that is uh, kind of affecting the crypto ecosystem right now? Um, I think it, that, that problem does exist on a number of projects today, uh, but it's very hard to tell, right? So Amazon wasn't profitable for like 10, 15 years, and then they eventually become profitable and they become very profitable. So, but they were able to sustain that growth until to that, to that point. So, um, and then the Ponzi schemes, they use the new user's money to subsidize the previous user's money. Um, those are Ponzi schemes, they don't last. So, uh, but there is a middle ground, a, a kind of a, a middle ground, like gray area where projects use incentives to attract users to come in, hoping that once they get enough users, they will somehow build a viable business model. Um, and uh, those guys, they, some, many of them will fail and they will look like, uh, almost like Ponzi's. Um, in this case, UST, Lona, uh, it kind of feel, feel, fell, fell into this case where they have very aggressive incentives, but then the business model couldn't catch up. So, uh, but, it, but it was clear based on the actions they took, they, threw, they spent all $3 billion trying to you know, save the market. They, yeah, they, didn't, they didn't take the money and run away. Um, it was just like they didn't operate very well. Um, so yeah, um, there's a lot of those things to learn. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, thanks a lot, Cici. That was a very interesting to talk to you today. Thank you so much, cheers.